Good morning. Welcome to Artifact Live. My name is Scott MacArthur. And this is a show where we look at the art and science of storytelling. And this week, we're going to be looking at storytelling at work. Now, this is one of my absolute favourite topics. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in three parts over the next 10 weeks or so. So there's probably going to be, well, next week I'm going to do a particular show about, about film. I think the following week I may have one about magic and then we'll come back to work because there's so much to talk about in this space. But I, I'm quite excited about this one. So uh, I hope I hope you find it useful. And the reason I'm excited is that this is probably the subject that is least considered um, in the leadership world that I believe can give you a real edge. And it's something that we can all do. Uh, so most a lot of us think we can't, but we can actually all do it. Um, but I'm going to gently take you into how I got interested in this. I'm going to uh, tell you a story, of course, about how I how I get into it, and then via via a few artifacts and um, a couple of stories, including whiskey. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get you thinking about how you might be able to use story at work. But a few points of um, administration before we, we get going. If you're watching from the uh, the Empathy Engine Facebook group, um, thanks very much for tuning in. If you want your name to appear in the chat, if you've got any comments um, in the Empathy Engine Facebook group, you'll see there's a little link there. It's on the screen just now. You need to click that and three clicks later. It doesn't ask for any particular information. Just click, 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 and your name will appear in the chat if you ask any questions. So thanks for that, if you can do that. Anyone else, uh, if you're tuning in via Facebook, it should happen okay uh, automatically, so you don't need to do this. And certainly from LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, it should work reasonably easy. It's a bit of a footer uh, that you've got to do that from a person, from a Facebook group, but hey-ho. I'm sure there's a reason for it. I haven't got a clue what it is, but I'm sure there's a reason for it. So. Um, so that's really all the, the particular admin I have to do. Uh, last week was terrific. Uh, I really appreciated the feedback uh, from my session with Peter Edge. I thought Peter was fantastic. And he, he, he brought a, a particular um, combination of another subject, lost knowledge, we talked about last week. Hence, I think I've still got my fedora sitting here. Um, we talked about the lost knowledge. And he brought a, you know, a, a sort of humbleness and a comedy to the program that I really appreciated. And again, a bit like storytelling, lost knowledge is one of these things that people just so rarely talk about and yet it can really help an organisation. So if you haven't seen uh, Show 28, please go back and have a look on Facebook. It's up there. Um, it's well worth watching. It was a terrific show. So this week, well, where do we start? Uh, storytelling at work. Um, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Uh, storytelling is the leadership competence that has the potential to do the most have the most impact, but receives the least amount of attention. If you go and look at an MBA program, very rarely does it talk about storytelling. If you go and look at online uh, courses about leadership, very rarely do they talk about storytelling. Now, there has been during lockdown a little bit of a growth in in the whole idea of storytelling, which I'm so happy about. Uh, but I still think it re receives far too little attention. It's something that I think. I've said it again, uh, I'll say it again, can give you an edge at work, in your personal life, anywhere, if you're able to tell stories. So where to start? Well, I thought I'd start with, with, with one of my own stories, really, and it's a short one, um, but it explains how I get into storytelling. Let me just double check. There's no questions. No, no questions yet. That's fine. Um, hello. Thank, thanks for joining. I can see you popping in. Uh, do you know, I love this time on a Tuesday morning. My, my, my telephone goes... <laughs> all these things appear on my on my various social platforms it's really great so thanks for joining me folks and how did I start well I had as those of you who have tuned in before know I started my career off as a, a, in research and in, in arthritis research playing about with microscopes uh, and then I moved in by by luck and happenstance into um, HR now some people might not think that was lucky but it, but it was um, and I actually joined a company which I will always be grateful for, um, for their training, for their um, support, uh, and for the friendships I've developed over the last 30 years with these people, and that was British Gas. Now, I joined them at an interesting time. It was just when Thatcher had um, basically gone through a process of um, privatising all the the key services in the United Kingdom. Uh, I won't say much more on that. You can probably tell from my my voice that I was not impressed. Anyway, but because of that, um, there was a whole load of things happening in the gas industry across Europe, and, and I was lucky enough to be part of that. 
And one thing that we got, and, and it's something that, that British Gas did really, really well. Now, I remember my HR director, and for the life of me, I can't remember her name, which is really embarrassing. I've even asked my colleagues from back then, uh, and we can't remember her name, which is really odd because she was fantastic. And I was working in, in a, a town just south of Manchester at the time called Olshigham, and uh, that's in Cheshire. Uh, so it's where all the sort of the footballers live and all that sort of thing. It's not that fancy, but it's a nice part of the country. Um, anyway, we had a, a, a absolute commitment to learning. And the reason for that was, and I got that from the HR director, because I, I said to her, um, we, were, we were setting targets and I was personnel officer, welfare and recruitment. There's an odd uh, combination, but that's what it was. Welfare and recruitment with a lot of staff, with 30,000 staff, uh, a lot of recruitment I was responsible for, and a massive commitment to welfare, um, which is all coming back, which is interesting. Anyway, and one of the things that they used to do back then was they would set targets for us. Now, in vogue at the time were competency interviews, competency models, where you had to, when you were going through an interview process, you had to ask the delegates specific questions and they had to give specific examples of, of where they had done the things they'd said on their CV or in their application. Um, now it's gone out of fashion a little bit, but there was a part of it was interesting because as part of the training to do this, we went along to, we had our own college at the time, it was called Mere College, which was down a, a bit deeper into Cheshire. It was a very, it was very beautiful uh, sort of it's now a hotel a beautiful cheshire hotel that'll give you an idea of the quality of the building it was all higgledy piggledy it was two or three hundred years old uh, it's squeaky floorboards i can even remember the smell now but that was uh, our own little private college dedicated to our learning and development and if any of my gas colleagues are watching you'll, you'll remember it because it was it was an amazing place and anyway, i was doing a what was it called the certificate in management studies and it was horrific because it was one of these portfolio based certificates, but we all had to do it. And I didn't like it because it was all about, you know, gathering evidence and it got a bit tedious, to be honest. But anyway, we were doing it and the training that was supporting it though was very, very good. And there's one fella who complete legend in, in British Gas Northwest. His name was David Kelso. David unfortunately has passed, but he was a, a very funny, quite gruff golf fanatic who liked a dram. And um, but it was a very good trainer and a very um, how to describe him? Maybe if someone's in from the gas, you can help me here. But he was a he, he was a very honest chap who said what he thought to everybody. Some people find him quite rude, but I, I thought he was a I guess a friendly a friendly grump if you like. But anyway, he, he ran a lot of the training for us, and I was a, a middle level uh, personal officer. That's equivalent to the HR business partner that you get today. And we were doing a course on, I think it was on relationship management, and we were looking at gathering data and evidence from our careers. And that was okay, but what the bit that really caught me, and I'll never forget it, it was right at the end um, of one of the, I think it was a five-day event in this amazing college. And David would start to ask questions around the room. And I remember asking these questions about, okay, tell me what your experience is. Now, he wouldn't take any BS. He, he would, you know, if you started to talk about, well, I was working on the sustainability of the value of the whatever, you know, the sort of Simon Sinek bollocks, he, would, he wouldn't accept it. He would say, no, no, I need a story. I need you to tell me what you actually did. Now, what he was doing was he was he was looking at the competency model and saying, right, I've got to get these kids, because he was a good 15, 20 years older than us. I've got to get these kids thinking about their stories at work. So he was thinking about our progression, to be honest. So that, that was the sort of model they had at British Gas at the time. It was quite, it was quite progressive in itself. But I remember sat there in Mere College, him asking me questions about how I knew or how I could demonstrate that I was statistically competent. And I think it was at that point that David got me thinking about my previous career because I was only young. I was only young daft laddie and, and I hadn't really thought about my scientific career that much. And that might surprise you because, you know, nearly every week I talk about when I was in the laboratories, you know, but I didn't then. I, I hadn't, I hadn't analyzed it. And remember last week and previous weeks as well, I've talked about, um, you know, how you need to be an archaeologist of your own life. Well, I think that was the moment that I started to think about the value in my own story in my career. So that has developed over the years. And thank you, David. You know, he, he was such a an interesting chap. But I think that was the genesis of it. Um, but now, you know, 30 years later, 
is it 30 years? Yeah, it's roughly t- 26 years later or something. I'm sat here and I'm broadcasting about storytelling. And it's such an exciting time in the world of work to be interested and aware of the power of storytelling. Now, you'll know that I talk about, and I'll do it at the end of this show, you know, at the end of every show I say, you know, remember to share your own stories because those those stories can change the world. And it's true. And I'm going to give you homework this week for the first time. I'm going to give you a film to watch. There's a reason for that. But because I think that we, we need to really explore that a little bit further. But let me tell you why I think this is exciting. I think the the digital world um, has has democratised our ability to broadcast our stories, to distribute our stories. It used to be that the, the power for uh, you know distributing stories out with an organisation was really difficult because maybe there was newspapers and magazines and you know maybe television and radio, but that was it. And if you're running a small business or you're running your own, you know, you're you're, you're creating your own personal brand, a brand something I'm going to talk about a fair bit today. You 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 didn't really have ability to share that brand out. So your brand was, if it was a small brand, it was pretty much guaranteed to stay a small brand, apart from word of mouth in your area, which could grow and it could become big. But now the opportunities are much bigger the bigger than they ever were. Now that I think is really interesting. And let me give you an example of that, because um, I, I think this is an area that a lot of us forget, and I include myself in this sometimes. I mean, I'm better at it than I used to be, but if you see yourself as a brand, you see yourself as a brand, there's a lot you can do using the stories to get people engaged in that brand. Because see, I believe stories, I've, I've, I've never really used this metaphor before, but stories are like a magnet. They, they can they can magnetise the environment. They can bring people towards you very strongly. Of course, they can repel them as well, like, like a magnet. A magnet, if you turn it the other way around, it repels people. But but let me give, give you a little example. Um, a few years ago, I've got a book here I want to show you. Um, if you've ever heard of, um, there's a Scottish writer who is, is pretty famous out with Scotland. Um, he's written some brilliant books like The Wasp Factory and, um, uh, books like, um, The Crow Road and, uh, Espadier Street, which is my particular favorite. His name is Ian Banks. And he, he also wrote some amazing sci-fi. And I mean, we've had a show about sci-fi and we talked about how sci-fi is basically the story of change, but this particular book, is different to, to all the other books that he wrote. And it within the, this, he actually hooked me into something that, um, well, it's become part of my life. He tells a story in here. I mean, it basically, it's, it's about whiskey. And I mean, those of you who know me, I like my whiskey. And I'm going to, I'll put this, I won't put it on the screen yet, actually, I won't. I'll just tell you the story. Basically in here, he talks about, and he talks about examples of extreme whiskies. Now, I like my whiskey strong. I like um, the strongest of them all. It's one called Laphroaig. Uh, I think it's a glorious whiskey, but a lot of people really find it difficult to drink. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is he then says, uh, I also like wine, and I think there's a wine that is comparable to Laphroaig. And this wine, I've got a little picture here. Um, this wine is called Chateau Moussard. And what he says about that is, the comparison I think is most apt in the wider field of drink, uh, most apt, in the wider field of drink, is probably Chateau Massard. This is one of my favourite red wines in the world, and it is profoundly different. And it's well worth sitting within the canon of excellent wines. He goes on to say a lot about the flavour, and I'm not going to bore you with the detail. He does say it's spicy. But it's so different that it almost gets its own category of wines. Now, the, the Chateau Massard wine, if you've never heard of it, it blows your socks off. I mean, it's a, a very strong and spicy wine. But Ian goes on in that brilliant book. If you're interested in, in Scotland or you're interested in whiskey, I don't think there's any better book, um, Raw Spirit in Search of the Perfect Dram, than this book by Ian Banks. It's absolutely glorious. But he goes on to describe not only the flavour of the wine, but he also goes on to describe how it's made. And and I think more importantly than that, sorry, I've got something in my um, uh, where, you know, how it's made and by whom. It's by the Hotcher family. And it's actually a Lebanese wine. Lebanese wine. Now, that's not a famous part of the world for wine. Um, but the other thing that's even more amazing than that, that this wine w- w- really had its genesis during the Civil War in the Lebanon. 
And he paints a picture of these vineyards, not big, they're not huge because it's a special wine. It's a quite a rare, but not so much now, but it was back in the 80s, quite a rare wine. And he paints a picture of this winemaker, Sergio, making the wine amid, amidst these bombs falling out of the sky, literally. I mean, it was literally in the middle of the Civil War that they started to make this wine. That was it. Hooked. I was completely hooked. Um, I thought, yeah, I've got to try this. So I went out. It was 18 quid a bottle. Uh, now, I, for someone who was a an aficionado of Aldi's own white wine and Aldi's own red wine, spending 18 quid on a bottle of red wine was quite a, quite an investment for me. I now buy it in crates because I love the stuff. It is absolutely brilliant. But I think he got me with the story. It's a very small. It's not so small now. It's still a small. It's not. It's not a hugely well-known wine, but nevertheless, it's it's growing. But it's still a small business. But through the power of the democratization of social media that I talked about before, to distribute stories has become a world-class brand. Now that was only the introduction for me. I mean, these are these are the sort of things that that they're everywhere now, and I'm sure you've got your own examples of that now. If you've never tried Chateau Massard wine, I dare you to go out and try it. And I've got a few comments here. I'd just like to test. Uh, Say hello to people. Um, good day, sir, from Twitch. Hello, I think that's Andy. Yes, it is. Thanks very much for joining us. That's lovely. Hello, Doug. How are you doing? And Doug says, um, if you remember, I used to use stories to sell £100 shots, yes, of cognac at the hotel. It's insane what a story will make people do. Absolutely brilliant example. You know what, Doug? I'd forgotten about that. Uh, I think I might need to have that story in my little book because... What Doug did was exactly that. He would he would say, "Look, this came from a particular place in a particular barrel, uh, you know, and it was it's it sold. It was, I think it was two hundred odd years old, Doug, if I remember right." And 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 it puts another point across that's that's really interesting. I've actually purely by coincidence, I've got this as a caption. If I can find it, yeah, here we go, Doug. Look at that. Without any prompting, people tend not to recall the data, but they tend to remember the stories. And I hadn't thought of that story for. Oh, 20 years but it, it still embeds in your brain and it comes out um, at the appropriate time so I think it's a great example that Doug thank you for sharing it of how important it is to start to become an archaeologist of your own stories so where do we take that next well there's so many ways I can go here um, but I think I'll stick to um, the sort of the, the I'm just going to tell lots of stories today because there's so many of them in the in the workplace that uh, I think they're, they're, they're just telling them will help you. I'll give you another one. I was working uh, for one of the big IT companies, a company called Atos, um, which um, used to be KPMG Consulting, Siemens Consulting, uh, and then it ended up being called Atos. And I was working there um, about well, ten years ago. I left now, but um, we had a particular deal or potential deal with the Royal Mail. And I was responsible for a team called the Impact Team at the time. And our job was basically to use storytelling and different techniques to win his work. Now, it turned into quite a successful endeavor, and I'm very proud of those days. And the team that I had are still a world-class team. I mean, they're, they're all, they've all left now, but they're all in great jobs. They're doing really, really well, and I'm so proud to work with these guys. But uh, let me tell you this story. The, 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 the bid that we were looking at was a big one. It was 200 odd million pounds. It was a one of these big IT platforms. Uh, I think it was SAP, but it might have been Oracle that we were trying to put into the Royal Mail. And one of the jobs I had was the bid teams. So these are the guys that would do pitching. They would go in and they would pitch to the customer, usually near the end of the process to see who could win the deal. The team came in and I'd been helping them a little bit uh, and they did, a, they did a pitch and they did okay, actually. It was all right. Um, but I was sitting there thinking, how is this different from everything else that these people are going to see? And the answer to that was, it wasn't. It was it was a fairly what they call a vanilla uh, pitch. It was a vanilla product. It was it was a sort of thing we knew would work. They knew would work. And when you get vanilla, it tends to come down to cost. Now we knew that we had a competitive uh, deal. We, we could we could give them a competitive deal because we were a massive company and we knew we were competitive. But we also knew. The people like Capgemini, Fujitsu uh, were also competitive. And so we had to think, how can we help them remember us after the event? Now, remember what I said about um, people might not remember your data, but they tend to remember your story. So what we did was uh, we, we had a brainstorming session. We, we had this glass sort of uh, 
cube that we used to work in. Everybody could watch what we were doing. And we used to write on the wall, on the windows, you know, and we used to stick things in the windows. It was quite radical at the time. And it's a long time ago now, 10 years ago, but uh, more than that, 12 years ago. Um, but we used to do this. And we were thinking about, you know, what did Royal Mail do? And I asked the team, you know, what did the Royal Mail do? They're all like, well, that's an obvious question. I said, oh, come on, what, what did they do? And it was like, well, deliver letters, deliver parcels. And back at, back then, there were there were many more letters going out than there were. Like, the email hadn't taken off the way it has come and gone since. But uh, so I thought, OK, letters, what does that mean? And they all looked at me and they went, what do you mean, what does that mean? I said, well, what's the product? Letters. I said, right. And what about letters? What do you, what do you think about letters? What makes a good letter? And we had a, a little discussion about it. And then somebody said, I can't remember, I think it was, it was a guy called Greg, actually. Hi, Greg, if you're watching. Um, he said, yeah, the, the, the lovely handwritten letters are, are, are beautiful, aren't they? I remember getting them from my grandmother or something. He said, I can't remember. I mean, I'm making that up. Greg, forgive me. I'm making that up. But it was something like that. And we said, I said, OK, why don't we handwrite the deal, the proposal? Now, this was a document this size. And I said, why don't we handwrite it? Because we need to make sure that they remember our story against all the other competition. This is a money deal. This is not a deal on, this is a deal on price, not on product. How do we help them remember? So what we did, I kid you not, we went out and we found a calligraphy company, a company that writes letters for a living. And we commissioned them to write our proposal in ink, actually more than that, with beautiful handwriting, with you know the fountain pen uh, writing, and we sent it as part of our proposal. More than that, when we did our pitch, we did the whole pitch with slides using the same font. Now, there's clever ways you can do it. You can actually do it with your own writing now. You can actually make your own writing into your own font. But uh, but in those days, we just got the standard font and we used that. But in, again, in calligraphy like writing, and I remember the feed, we won the deal. And I remember uh, when we got to know the client uh, and we'd go out and have a drink with them and we'd chat to them about things. And I asked them, I remember asking the procurement director at the time, I remember saying to her, I said, look, why did you select us? She said, well, absolutely honest, Scott, because of the way you presented the proposal, because all the prices were basically the same. We remembered your proposal. We loved the effort that went into it. That's why you got it, right? So again, Linking it back to the story about, you know, because of di digital freedom and digital democratization of distribution of stories, you've also got to think about how do I differentiate myself in the market from other people if I'm in a competitive environment or from other organizations if you're in a sales environment. So once again, you know, storytelling came to the fore and also how you deliver that story came to the fore. So I hope they found that that's a true story, um, and I was delighted with that. We did that technique became part of um, the way we actually did all our bids. We we would sit down and we'd say, right, okay, who's this company? What do they do? How do we then deliver the proposal or the pitch or both in a way that matches their environment? And that became a very very strong differentiator for our organisation. And I do remember, I have to say, a lot of other consultancies starting to copy that. Um, but that started that day in that glass bubble where we were talking about the Royal Mail and how we could differentiate ourselves. I think the, the, the one I, I, I wasn't directly involved in it, I was sort of, I'd set the hair running, but there was a, a bid we did for a Formula One team. It was for the, well, it was at Wilson. Yeah. Uh, is that the right name? I can't remember. Anyway, that, I think it was them. And what we did was we got these handheld, it was back in the day when the, the IT wasn't quite as uh, uh, complex as it is now. Hold on, let's take this caption off the screen. Um, and uh, we basically these handheld like Formula One steering wheels, and in the middle there was like a little screen. I guess a, a forebear, a forefather of the, the iPhone, and on that we actually got our whole proposal animated, and it was on there so that when they they, they they could do that, give it to their kids, but also they could remember the unique way that we delivered that pitch and won that work as well. So it's a, it is definitely a way. The, so the story is important, and the way you deliver the story are important, and in the corporate world. It is critical that you start to think about that. So why, again, why stories? Well, I've never really spoken about this, and I'm not going to dwell on it this week. I think it's going to be one I'm going to come back to in a lot more depth. But about 10 years ago, I came across some quite interesting research um, into what happens in the mind. And previous guests, Linda Shaw and Ashok, have talked, spoken about you know, the impact of stories on the brain. Uh, and if you haven't seen those episodes, I'd urge you to go back and have a look. Um, but there's one particular hormone that's released called oxytocin, and it's kind of called the 
the love hormone and there's all sorts of nonsense around it about how you know if you take oxytocin it can make you more trustworthy all that stuff is in in progress there's no definitive outcomes from the research at the moment well not that i'm aware of but but nevertheless there's something about how a good story releases that that magnetic hormone it draws people towards you and and that's where i want to take my next next story but before i do that i'm just going to check to see if there's anything in the chat that i should be sharing with everybody uh, there's nothing really there. No, I'll, I'll leave those. Okay, so the next one I want to tell you about, and, and I think Andy's in, so this is interesting. Uh, Andy's part of this. Um, I am I'm very keen on culture and very proud of being a Scot. And I'm always looking for ways of, you know, talking about, thinking about Scotland, whether it's poetry, literature, art, whatever. And the reason for that is I don't think there's enough uh, of Scottish proper culture out there there's a lot of sort of hedrum hodrum red hair and tartan and shortbread nonsense out there uh, i know that because i used to work in a kilt maker that sold nothing but shortbread tartan and nonsense uh, to usually to gullible americans but uh, and, and japanese people but i'm always looking for ways of you know finding culture and and, and sharing that and you've been victim to some of my poetry and to people like Hugh McDermott and, and Nan Shepherd that you probably have never heard of. But, uh, you know, these are the sorts of people I'm always looking to, to promote on my, my vlog and in my writing. And um, one day, um, now I'm, I'm bringing three or four stories together to make a, an answer that, that didn't happen quite as perfectly as this. But Andy and I, who's on, uh, we, we do a, a, a live show on a Friday night about a music venue called the Glasgow Apollo. And... Um, that that doesn't matter if you're not if you were never there or you don't like music it doesn't matter it, but it's been astonishing because we are now getting on average a hundred new members to our Facebook group every week and it's got like nine thousand one hundred members at the moment so Andy and I are kept pretty busy by it but it's an amazing thing and then I think about six months ago I don't know if you remember Andy if you're there but I think it was about six months ago I think it was I can't remember who one of one of us had the idea that maybe we should start to capture some of the stories from these people on video and um, that came to me really from another book and um, this book um, this is this is an amazing book if you've never seen it before it's become a quite a phenomenon humans of new york stories by brandon stanton and um, this is a gorgeous book and it's basically as it says it's about it's basically lots of pictures of people in new york and underneath it there's a very brief story and there's a number of these really resonated with me. There's one in particular, i put this down, it's a big heavy book. Um, one of them in particular, and it's just one picture with one line, right? A picture and a line. Um, and um, here's here's my favourite one. I love this. Look at this. Now, you know I like my uh, my skulls, uh, my memento mori, you know, remember, what it, you know, remember uh, to make the best out of your life because it's short. This is a guy uh, who had on his arm a tattoo and the tattoo is there uh, because these are the coordinates uh, of a cabin in Arizona where this fella almost died of carbon monoxide, monoxide poisoning. Just a reminder. I was like, whoa, look at that. You know, and I thought, I love that. And I thought, I wonder if we could do something like that with the Apollo. So Andy and I started to ask people to contribute. And I have to say, it's been tough. They're, they're, they're all probably over 45. Uh, a lot of them are over 60. Uh, and so a lot of them aren't particularly used to using technology. But nevertheless, they've started to come in, the stories. Now, this is really important because it, it again, acts as a magnet. And I think this is why the, the Facebook group has been so successful. There's a lesson there for anyone running a business or running a Facebook group. I'm going to show you a very short clip of one. Now, this is ridiculous. The amount of, This guy is a professional filmmaker. He works on one of the big American TV shows that you definitely know. It, it's, he's at that level. But this is a guy called Doug who very kindly sent us this. And I'll just I'll keep talking while he's... Here's of Doug. Gig here at the Glasgow Apollo was, uh, so Doug was always brilliant. had it used was, these professional skills. The Remember, this, this venue closed in 1985. And what he's done is he's, he's, he's created this background, he's created this, this image, and he tells his story about how he's a big Stranglers fan. Now, the resonance with that is fantastic. You know, the oxytocin is flying with all the other people in the group. And you know what? We're both extremely proud of that because we, what we've done is we've created this community around story. I don't know if you're there, Andy, if you, you know, want to say anything about it, if you do, come on, mate, and, and say it. But uh, it is extraordinary. And there's someone saying, 
I, who's this Facebook user? I was at the Apollo. I remember harvesting the mushrooms off the flock wallpaper. Ugh. <laughs> That's true. The, the, the Apollo did smell a bit. Um, but but the point of that is that, that the stories is what I'm terrified of losing. You know, we, we, we co-wrote, uh, produced a book a few years ago, uh, and it, it's full of people's memories. But now I'm, uh, along with Andy, very keen to grab the actual moments to get people to talk about them. And there's a huge lesson here for corporates, an absolutely massive lesson here for corporates, because, I mean, how serious are you about things like alumni? Well, I know. We spoke about it last week with, with Peter Edge. Companies don't take it seriously. They, they just move on. They just move on. They just move on. And they forget that corporate intelligence that's in the organisation. Now, we're only doing it in a fun way for a music uh, thing, but... That actually is a very powerful technique. Capture the stories because they can save you time and money when the new people take over from the people from the past. So just think about it. But I think the, 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 the main thing is the humans of New York, the Glasgow Polo stuff has all gone really well. And I think it's because of storytelling. Absolutely because of storytelling. So what are companies doing in this space? Well, I, I was fortunate enough uh, to speak um, uh, for Microsoft uh, about two months ago. And because of that, I got a bit under the skin and I'd, I'd worked there before, but it was about uh, a long time ago. Um, but I got under the skin a little bit and asked a lot of questions and, you know, this sort of curiosity. I mean, story, you could argue that stories are cu curiosity manifest. But anyway, I was asking stories. I don't know if you're there, Stacey, but hi, Stacey, if you're there. And, um, she told me lots of things about what Microsoft are doing in this space. Now, Microsoft are by no way perfect and I don't really particularly believe in benchmarking, but I like what they're doing in that space. They've got things called storytelling Sundays where the Microsoft teams get together online and they just tell each other stories. I mean, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, could be, because from that, they then create a, a better understanding of each other. They create empathy between each other, but then they have stories that they can use when they're out there talking to customers. So how do I do this? Right. This, this is something that I had some help from an artist friend of mine. Um, there's a word that you don't, you don't need to know what it means really. I'll tell you, but it's not important. Um, in, in the scientific literature, all oh, my books are falling down. One of my heroes in biology is an ant biologist called E.O. Wilson. Um, now he went in and out of fashion over the, the last 30 or 40 years. He's in his nineties now, but he's still hale and hearty and writing. Uh, but one of the ideas he had um, was about how knowledge isn't as defined within channels as some people think. And he wrote a book back in the day, back in the 90s, called Consilience. Now, this is a word. It's not his word, but he's very much associated with it. And I don't recommend the book, unless you're really into studying science and art and how they mix. It's not a book. I mean, I love it, but it's not a book that I'd particularly recommend. It's quite, it's quite heavy going. But in that, he says... You know, if you look at something that is probably real, so an effect, whether it's a, a and I mean, I'm stretching the metaphor a bit, stretching the story, but whether it's a, you know, customer service, uh, whether it's a, a general service or it's technology or, it, or it's a physical, you know, product, the more people from different, he calls them magisteria, but the more people from different areas that say, yeah, this works, tends to make it likely that it does work. Um, and therefore, it, it's something that you should buy. Something is consilient. It's got multiple routes into it that suggest that it actually works. So I thought about that. And I thought, right, how can I use that? So I've got this this friend of mine, David, who's been on the show, uh, a terrific artist. And he, I, I got him to draw the word. But what I got him to do is to draw the word, but through what I call my story world. And this is a way I think people could use story or start to develop their archaeological skills in gathering their own stories at work or out of work to use in their personal or work lives. Now, in this picture here, you can see you, some of them are obvious. You, you'll, you'll get the, you know, the microscope. The O is, is tartan quite deliberately. The N is my writing tools. Uh, the S is my consulting and a, a network, as is the I. That's the specific consulting one. The, 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 the saxophone is there to represent the Apollo and the music stuff. The microphone, the I, is my speaking. The E is my commitment to personal fitness. The, the, the N is a rugby player, not only for my love of rugby, because I'm also involved in the rugby world. Uh, the open mouth is about communication and sharing stories. 
And the elephant is one of my absolute favourite stories about cognitive diversity. So you can see that my story world, this is where I, when I'm preparing a speech or like the other day I was I was writing, I was just sat down and I thought, what am I going to write about today? I use this as, as this story world to create my specific story lines. So from each one of those parts, I'll pick out, you know, I can say, okay, let me think about music today. And, I'll, and, and the minute you say something, at least certainly with me, the minute I say, right, I'm going to think about my music memories or about my music passions or my beliefs or whatever it is, favourite music, where I saw it, how I saw it, who I was with, I then start to pull out stories from it. And, you know, guys, it really works. Um, so that, for me, is one of the ways that I would suggest you start to create your own stories. But let me take it a step further. Um, and to the good old BBC again. I know they get a lot of flack these days, but I think a lot of that's fair. But anyway, that's another subject. But there's a, a BBC World Service show, and it's actually, I think it's stopped now. Don't hold me to it. Um, but what they did was they were talking about storytelling, and it was a, what was it, Catherine Gore, I think her name was. I, I, I can't remember if that's the right name. Core, Gore, something like that. Anyway, she would go out in the streets and she would just say to people, where are you going? That was it. And it was unbelievable how rich and how deep the responses were. When people found out it was a radio show, they would start to talk about what they were actually doing. You know, I'm going to visit my sick relative or I'm going shopping and I'm going to get this. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to the library because I'm interested. You know, and it would start to create, generate, I call them generative experiences. So it's a generative experience that starts to push out your stories. And just this week, uh, I mean, Andy, who is here, uh, I sent it to him. I was sitting thinking about education and I thought, well, I need to go right back to the beginning. You know, how did I get to where I am today and started to think about when I went to college? And I sat down and I hadn't thought about it for 30, maybe more than that, years. And stuff just started to come out. So if you are looking, and a few people have asked me, you know, how do you get your stories? Where do they come from? Well, I think it's quite important to just look at your own stories, go back and think about your own stories, your own experiences, and try to pull them out of yourself. When you get stuck, though, you know, you can use some techniques. Now, one of the ones that, again, I used a lot, uh, and I used this with a big, uh, a very large company sales team. Um, they, they were struggling a bit with the corporate stories. And I thought, well, I've got to get them out of the environment. I've got to shake them up a bit, sugar them up a bit, as they say in Scotland. So I come up with this idea of uh, of taking them for a walk and a talk. But walk was spelled W-O-K. It was actually to a restaurant where they had um, one of those teriyaki tables, you know, the round tables where they cook the food in front of you. So I went and I took them there. And, but more than that, we'd hired a very well-known chef um, in that, that domain. And he was telling the story of how the food became what it is. And of course, they got curious and then they started to ask questions and they started, then, then we just left them. And I was like, I was there, there was a guy called uh, Ian, who was the boss guy at the time. And we were just sitting there listening to the guys talk. And actually, it was amazing because in, in the in the office, they were all fairly corporate. You know, the, that's the, why I've got that picture of the guys with the, you know, the, the eye there with the, with the you know, the, the, the shirt and tie. They were all a bit stiff off of a lip, but we got them talking and it really, really worked. And it started to 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 un, unleash, if you like, and it's a that's a very wanky word, but get them to really think about their own particular story. There are ways you can do it. I mean, another example. Let me just check the so the feedback talk genius. I love it. Yeah, that's a, that's good. I can't ask for better feedback than that. Maybe get you to come on and tell some of your stories sometime about about alcohol. Um, why that word for your art story? Uh, which word? Consilience. Just remind me there, Joe. I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, doing this live, so I quite often forget stuff when I'm talking live. So if you could just remind me, that would be that would be great. It's one of the one of the perils of talking live on a broadcast. Uh, sometimes forget what you even say. But another another one, uh, and this was a a way of trying to so break you know break people's perception. Uh, I did a keynote. Um, for all the suppliers, um, let me just take that off. Sorry, Joe. Let me know what you're talking about there, and I'll, I'll, I'm sure I can answer it. Um, I was doing a keynote uh, in a, a fish factory, believe it or not, uh, at the for the London Olympic Games. Now it was quite peculiar. There's a story behind that as well, and I will write this out one day. But what happened was the guy who runs the fish factory 
his fish factory had been demolished and he was given money to rebuild his fish factory somewhere else because the land he was his original factory was on was being used for Olympic Games. But he was a canny so-and-so. And what he did was he, he, he got the money and then he built his fish factory, but above it he, bu- he built a conference suite with a massive window. I mean, massive window. I've got pictures. Uh, I must look them out. A massive window looking onto the Olympic Stadium. And I'm in this room. Uh, with 400 suppliers, right? Nearly all technology suppliers, uh, all of them basically in competition with each other. It was a bit, it was a bit tricky. But what I did was I called my talk, um, the other AI, right? Didn't tell them what it was, right? And uh, AI, um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence. That's what they thought. But they walked in and I said, there's another type of AI and it's called appreciative inquiry. Now, don't worry if you've never heard of it, it doesn't matter. But basically, it's a technique that you can use. The the idea is you use it to find good stuff in an organization. Once you find that, you spread it throughout the organization. So I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll use this AI technique. And you may have heard me talk about this before. when I used it when I was working in the sales environment, but I did it and this was in the tech environment. So I got them in the room, 400 companies, and there must have been 800 guys in the room, uh, people in the room, sorry. Uh, and I just said to them, like on this wall facing the Olympics, I want you to tell me the, the good stuff that's happening because of the Olympics. And on that wall facing the other part of the fish factory, a bit smelly, I want you to tell me the things that are holding you back. Boom, off they went, right? Um, uh, I don't know, four hours later, it's a bit more complex than that, but basically four hours later, they came back and there was all these key themes. They'd all started chatting to each other. That was what I was actually doing. They did, they, it's typical, like a typical psychological based uh, experiment where it's not the experiment, it's actually what happens when you're doing the experiment that matters. Um, and we got out of them some of the key themes, the key concerns, the, the problems that they had with perhaps other suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. We got out of them. And it really helped the Olympic Games become extremely successful. So that's another way I used it when I was working uh, in the, the, the big bad world of business. So just before I check the chat again, just a reminder, this is Artifact Live. My name is Scott MacArthur. And what we do in this show is we look at the art and science of storytelling. So let me just check and see if there's any more uh, questions. See if Joe's managed to remind me what the uh, why the word in your art story. Right, you need to tell me what the, what the word was. Uh, is, is this consilience you're talking about? Yes. Uh, well, consilience, I use that because I think it's a great way of, that's why I use poetry as well, Joe, um, because I can talk, you know, the, you know the poem I frequently talk about, you know, uh, start close in with the step you don't want to take, not the, not the first, not, 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 not the second, not the third, but the first by a poet called David White. Um, I can use that in the performance management domain. I can use it in the technology domain. I can absolutely use it in the program management, project management domain, because it, it just transfers. It's conciliant. It, it, it hints at a truth. So without me having to do this sort of, um, you know, what's the date? In fact, last night I, I was talking to Samantha, mother half, about a project she's working on. It's quite complex, and I won't talk about the specifics, but I said to her, I said, look, you know, What's the basics? What What's the first step that you want them to do, to take? And she went, oh, right. And, and off she went and she was thinking about that. Even in the project, I mean, she's an expert, but even in that area, you know, sometimes the obvious thing is right in front of your face and you need to look for ways of talking about it that aren't actually direct. They don't need to be in your face. They can be indirect. Um, and that's why I use that for uh, uh, one of my art stories, Joe. I don't know if that's the question you're asking, but hopefully it was. Hopefully it was. So, um. What I'd like to end with, I can't believe I've been wittering on for 45 minutes. That's amazing. Um, I'm really pleased this technology's worked this week because the other thing that, that I was doing, I've got, I had my fingers crossed behind my back because this is the upgraded version of Restream that's now apparently compatible um, with um, video. And it has been, Andy, you'll be pleased to hear that uh, from the, the Apollo show point of view because it's been a right fiddle the last few weeks trying to... Uh, you know, go backwards in time. A 19, it was 80, 86 Chrome was the only one that would let you play video without it stalling all over the place. So pretty, um, pretty, uh, pretty annoying. But, uh, what's Andy saying here? Not sure it's for the general public. Don't understand. It must be for something else, Andy. Sorry if I'm misunderstanding you. Anyway, um, so I want to end with something and it's homework. Now, I'd really like you to do this. Um, because I'm, I'm, I think it's something that, is extremely powerful. Now, you know that I've always said facts tell, but stories sell. 
And this is a film. Now, I've got a picture of it. Here it is here. Now, for those of you who are not into musicals, you'll be glad to hear it's not the play Le, Le, Le Miserable. Uh, it's a film. And uh, now I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Lad J. Lai, I think. Uh, Lad J. Lai. Um, it's a film. And it's on Netflix. I checked this morning. And this film is is amazing. Now, it is in French. Um, and Lad J. has a long story behind it. But basically what happened was... He, uh, he grew up in what is effectively the, like the council estates we have in the UK or the projects that they have in, in America. And when he was young, he was given a cine camera and he used to just film things that were going on uh, around him. And some of these things were, well, pretty difficult um, and pretty, um, you know, tough. And it looked mainly, and it's, this is why I think it's appropriate today to, to use this as homework because a lot of it was about the tension between local people and the police now that of course is all over the media at the moment and um the the thing that that really do what it's a very good film if you've never you know it, it is it is definitely a, a a couple of hours well spent so it's time well spent oh look i've got my time well spent merch on look at that look at that they're flying out i've sold two um, but uh, um, but this this is a story about living and growing up in these council estates and the outs and the sort of out the peripherique part of of, of uh, Paris, and it's really quite powerful stuff. So it's a good film anyway. But the kicker is that President Macron saw the film. Now um, you know that I like to push stories. Well, he saw this story. He saw Ladji's story on the film. And what he did was he set up a commission to look at um, inner cities uh, and and you know peripheric uh, council estates in Paris to see how they could improve them. So that story did actually generate a significant change of policy. It changed that world of work within the the, the equivalent of the council, the council that we have in the United Kingdom. So it's a very very good example of how storytelling. Some of the the, the movie you'll see, watch the movie. I don't want to spoil it. It's not all true. You know, there's bits of it are dramatised, etc. But it's very powerful. And if you'd like to see proper story in action and how it then took uh, France to a different place just by watching a film. We're seeing it just now with the, uh, is it Sea Spiracy it's called? I think it's a Sea Spiracy about fish. There's a lot, a lot of issues with that film. And I might come back to it, actually, because scientifically there's huge holes in it. But um, but nevertheless, it's it's creating a change, a horror almost, in people's perception. Now, the final thing I'll say on this is that, that I, I've had the, the pleasure, well, is it pleasure? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating being involved in the, the, the consequences of the Grenfell fire. Uh, and if you're overseas, the Grenfell fire was a terrible fire that happened in London a few years ago uh, where many people died. And the, the reason for the fire spreading so quickly was basically the cladding in the building. It's horrendous. Um, and I have been working with the different parties involved, so the services like the uh, the councils, the private property developers, the police, the fire brigade, the ambulance service. You know, you, you get you get the vibe. And it, I have to be I have to be honest, it's been tough. Um, they they are they they're very ingrained uh, cultures. Uh, lots of them very you know very good people, but you know not all the same, and find it very difficult to find common ground. And one of the things I've got that I had them thinking about, this was before lockdown, because obviously it's, it's had to be diminished because of lockdown. But I was trying to get them to come out with stories, a bit like what Ladji did in that film, to share their stories to try and affect change. Uh, and I'm, that's work in progress. It's definitely not finished. But uh, So that's it for this week. I'll just check the chat once more. Of bits and pieces. Yes, consilience. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Joe. I'm sorry, I was being a bit thick there. Yeah, that's why I use it. Uh, and it, 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 I mean, I know you're you're interested in science, Joe. And uh, consilience, I think, honestly, is a word that should be much more common, but people have never heard of it. I think it's a brilliant word. A brilliant. You know why? You know, different topics come to the same conclusion tends to make the the outcome more likely to be true. You'd never say fact if you're a scientist, but nevertheless, it's about things being more likely to be true. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, the other reason why I've given you that homework, of course, is next week we're looking at film. Uh, I've, I've been excited about doing this for ages and I put in the Empathy Engine Facebook group about two months ago, what's your favourite film? And I've had a whole load of these, so I'm going to talk about them. But I think film is really important because it can be about you know true stories or it can be about fiction. 
And during lockdown, we've become obsessed with films, haven't we? we binging on Netflix, binging on Amazon, binging on Sky TV, whatever it is you watch. So there's something in there that I really want to explore further. So thank you very much uh, for tuning in. It's been brilliant. Uh, it's been nice being on my own for a change again because I've been I've largely been having guests, um, which is, has been quite cool. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, and Andy's there, uh, the other thing that's come out of the storytelling piece about the, the Glasgow Apollo is there's a radio show coming on shortly. It's called If Walls Could Talk. And I'm delighted to say that one of the things they're featuring are the stories from our Apollo guys. So not just in the group, from out with the group, but uh, I will publicise that across the socials where it's available. So you'll hear uh, my dulcet tones and others talking about that, bringing the stories out and trying to attract people uh, to join our Facebook, etc. But as I've said before, when you go from today, watch out for stories. You know, this week could be the week where you spot a story that could change the world. A bit like the Les Miserables film, it's changed that Parisian world. Uh, it really can be powerful. So thank you ever so much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you next week. And remember, if you have any questions, just drop me a line, whether it's in the Facebook group or uh, scott at sculptureconsulting.com. That's scott at sculptureconsulting.com. And I'd be delighted to, to get back to you as soon as I can. So thanks again. See you next week, folks, when we're talking about film. <laughs>